Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for a very different Let's Chat. This time we're talking Let's Talk Youth Entrepreneurship. It's Youth Month and today I have the absolute privilege of sharing not my story because I'm by no means youth anymore, but stories of some amazing youth entrepreneurs that I've had the privilege of working with, engaging with, mentoring, having on some of our programs, using as a service provider. So I've really gotten to know these entrepreneurs at a deep and meaningful level, I would like to believe. And I'd like you to get to know them a bit more today. So we have on the line with us uh, in this panel today, Gift, Paseka and Tato, who are all rock stars in their own spaces. They have done so much for uplifting the status quo around youth entrepreneurship and really debunking some of the myths that we have seen um, around youth entrepreneurship. These are professional individuals. They're the best, uh, in my opinion, in terms of what they do and how they do it. And I'm just so looking forward to having you understand a lot more about who they are and how they've done what they've done. So I'm going to start with Gift. If you can just, Gift, briefly introduce yourself and your business passion and your business, and then we'll move on to Tato and then Paseka. Over to you, Gift. Thank you, uh, Jashri, and uh, hello everyone who just joined in. Um, yeah, super excited to be here. I do have to say, like, I feel so much pressure just having Paseka and Tata here. Uh, in my mind, I'm like, dude, like, say something smart. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's really exciting to be here. I'm, I'm Gift. I uh, originally uh, come from Limpopo. Um, my first business actually started there. I started selling ice creams lived in Tembisa a bit, went to study at the African Leadership University in Mauritius, and uh, I came back. At the moment, I uh, serve as a COO of uh, a company called Gudoti. And what we do essentially is we work with waste management companies to build digital infrastructure and digital tools that enable them to be more efficient and essentially reduce cost. Part of why we're doing this is, you know, waste is a really growing um, problem globally, and uh, there seems to be very little technology implemented in this industry. Thank you so much, Gift. Over to you, Tato. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's actually so great to connect with all of you. I think this is, you know, such an opportunity um, for all of us to kind of, you know, connect um, and more importantly, just be in a space of um, thinking more broadly around the opportunities that exist for all of us, not just, you know, us who are actually already youth entrepreneurs, but people who are looking at getting into it. Um, my name is Tato Katlange. I am uh, an entrepreneur from the Northwest, I'm currently 27 years of age. Uh, I started my first business when I was 20 years old. Um, just out of university and that was called Retaga and we manufactured solar powered backpacks for kids, ran that um, and built a factory that employed a total of 30 people, distributed 30,000 school bags across the continent um, and ran it successfully for six years until I decided to declare a victory over it. Um, and basically I felt as though that was me getting skin in the game um, and you know, I was just kind of very blessed to have done meaningful work that had a social impact um, in the space of obviously education, um, the empowerment of women and ultimately the environment. I then decided to take a sabbatical um, whereby for a year I literally did nothing um, but teach. <laughs> so I spent um, a lot of my time uh, in 2019 actually uh, speaking in public platforms, uh, trying to encourage young people to kind of not start Me Too businesses, um, but rather to think out of the box and do uh, meaningful work. Um, and that ended last year. And so at the beginning of this year, I took the leap to decide to start a new business, um, one that is not in manufacturing, and I'll share a little bit about it, but essentially it's called uh, Life with Tato. 
um, and it's a luxury group of businesses. So ideally, I want to build Africa's answer to LVMH, Condé Nast, and the Neta Porte group. So it's in the luxury space, um, which is kind of like, why would you go into the luxury space given where the world is at? And it's like, this is when great businesses are built. So yeah, I'm excited to be here um, and share a little bit about my experience. Thank you so much, Tato. You know, I always love hearing from you. And, you know, like a mum, I have stories of each one of these entrepreneurs. And during the course of this hour, I will be sharing some of those stories because they talk to the character of the individuals that we will be engaging with as well. So over to you, Paseka. Thank you very much, Tayshri. And uh, good afternoon to all the guests. Uh, Tato, it's good to see you again. It's been a while. Uh, gift, I hope to meet you in person someday, sooner rather than later. Uh, needless to say, uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Pasega Lesolang. I'm a social entrepreneur. I have an innovative spirit. And um, for those who don't know, I'm also ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyper Disorder. So basically, when I was young, they used to say I'm very naughty. But uh, fortunately, given the current uh, situation, I find myself creating solutions for, for very uh, random or, or common problems. Among the common problems that I've tackled as a, as a youth was, uh, was a leaking toilet, uh, which I found in my grandmother's house. And that's a story on its own. It has led me to found the company called WHC, which stands for Water Hygiene Convenience, what is our substance focus? Hygiene represents the green economy that we serve. Convenience is the innovative technologies and services that we provide to that regard. Um, I founded this company at the age of 18 and I got my first patent at 18. Today we are a multinational award-winning company. We have created over 30 jobs. We have a factory producing, two factories producing the leakless valves for the public and the private sector. We we have at least 40 patents in, uh, in four, approximately 40 countries. We've been doing not so bad. Uh, this situation has also curbed us a bit, which has helped us to evolve as a company. We are now looking into the fourth industrial revolution. We are evolving with a, a very credible stakeholder, if not partner, which I have no doubt that Jay Shri will touch on. Uh, because it's all due to Jay Shree's intervention that my company is now heading in the right direction. Um, like most entrepreneurs, I've faced many challenges. This is not my first business. By the way, I have a commerce background. I am not uh, an engineer, uh, so I, I am a vivid um, and um, serial entrepreneur. But this WHC business has been the core because all the other businesses has, have just been cash cows in order to reinvest into WHC. So I have put a lot of skin in the game as much as I've managed to raise a, a small kitty of money with uh, a few investors locally and internationally. So I'd like to share some of my experiences with the prompted uh, questions that Jayshree might have. And thank you very much for taking the time to, to listen to our stories. Thank you so much, Paseka. Um, Gift, now that you've heard from your two co-youth entrepreneurs, is there anything else you would like to add to your story? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I also had uh, several companies that I didn't mention that didn't work out uh, so well. Um, so upon moving from Tembisa to, uh, I mean, from Limbobo to Tembisa, um, I was staying in a single rented room with my mother and we would go to shopping every, every single time. And I, I normally say that, you know, she used me as a cart and I used her as a credit card because, you know, she would give me all the packages to carry around from the taxi rank all the way to our house. Um, and it hurt. So carrying a lot of like grocery stuff in a plastic bag hurts. So my first kind of invention, and uh, maybe I should have met you a bit early because we didn't have a patent. But uh, the first invention was essentially something I called a solder. So the 
holding device that uh, you put on your hands and it kind of lessens the pain that you you get when you're holding plastic and the kind of big audacious goal was to have these uh, little devices in every single store uh, throughout South Africa and potentially even even Africa which unfortunately didn't happen uh, but so many lessons learned there um, and I think I will be touching uh, on, on some of the lessons learned there. Thank you so much, Gif. So for those of you that have joined us, I'm speaking to some amazing youth entrepreneurs. Please do use the chat function to place any of your questions and I'll make sure we get to them a little bit later. So now for some stories. Um, the first time I met Tato was in an SA Breweries uh, classroom where I was running a workshop. Is that right, Tato? So it was a while ago. And uh, since then, Tato has been in and out of my life as an entrepreneur, as a supplier, and just someone that I truly admire. As One a daughter. <laughs> as an adopted daughter as well. As Tato calls me, what do you call me, Tato? I can't ever remember you're that term. You're my mother. You're my mother in business. <laughs> I'm, her mother in, <laughs> I'm her mother in business. Yes. So the one day uh, we were launching a Women in Innovation um, conference, the first ever for a large bank that I was working at. And the day, the day before the conference, I get a call from Tato, and this is exactly what Tato says. Jay, I would like to speak at your conference, uh, this breakfast event for Women in Innovation. And I'm like, you know, Tato, the, the list of uh, delegate panelists have already been selected. And she was like, yes, but I have a message I want to share. And I said to her, okay, uh, since they know who I am, you can have my slot. <laughs> and I'm actually the program director. So I'll weave in whatever I want to say. And I gave my slot to Tato. But that just, and I've got lots of other stories about Tato, but that just goes to show the drive and the tenacity of youth entrepreneurs and this is what i miss um, in some of the other programs that we run because youth entrepreneurs in my mind they just see the big picture and it's very difficult for them to take no for an answer so on that point tato what are some of the challenges you have faced as a youth entrepreneur and how do you think we can solve for some of those challenges um I actually didn't remember that I was that wild. <laughs> um, look, I think some of the lessons that I've personally picked up was um, around the fact that you need to build a, a business that, you know, looks at what is going to happen in the future and try reconcile what is happening present day to align what, with what is happening in the future. So, when I started um, my first business, Ritaga, it was in 2013. And at the time, no one was talking social entrepreneurship. No one was talking social impact. No one was talking about, um, you know, just understanding sustainability. It was all still very much boxed into what we call CSI. Um, and so it was kind of a, a courageous um, step to get into the space of one manufacturing and then saying, you know, as someone who was at the time 20 years old, I'm going to start a business that is manufacturing products made from waste. Um, and then you're tackling three things at the same time and trying to kind of define what being a social entrepreneur is at the same time. So 2013, no one cared about like sustainability. And I say this because we would have meetings um, with our corporate clients because our business model was such that we have our corporates who purchase the school bags on behalf of children um, as part of their CSI budget. And so what we were met with was, you know, the old tried and tested ways of doing things, i.e. let's buy soccer balls for kids um, who are living in in uh, under, underdeveloped communities. And so it was almost like people were doing the easy thing. Let's buy school balls. Let's put like, let's get bags from China that cost like 20 rand and brand it and give them like a, a coloring pencil or something. So it was an interesting time to start a business uh, where we had to educate our customers on, on what we were actually solving for. So I think some of the problems that I've seen with, young people who are starting businesses is that 
they're not willing to actually one do the research so go into um if you've got a business you know you need to go into your customers home have conversations real conversations and understand what kind of problem are they actually facing and it's not this idea in your head because i think a lot of people get um excited by them innovating and it's like yeah but is that an actual real problem that a lot of people are facing um and they're actually willing to pay money for it and if they're not willing to pay money for it i.e they don't have um the income to afford what you're offering who is actually willing to pay for that uh, product or service. And so for me, I think a lot of the problems that we were faced with in trying to sell um, our products, we could easily navigate um, conversations where you know, people in corporate just didn't understand what it means for a child who doesn't have a school bag, um, who doesn't have sufficient light at night to study. So for us, it was like, it was, it was really important for us to have done our research because then that allowed us to show up in each room confident enough to one, educate um, whoever was in the room around what problems we're solving. And then we could actually make the sale because it came from an informed place. And it's not, you know, because someone felt sorry for us because we're young, it's like shame. Just sign the check, give them, you know, give them enough for a hundred school bags. But it was like, oh, this is actually an interesting business. Um, and, and I say business because I think the problem with youth that I've also noticed is that we're not building businesses that make commercial sense. It's almost like we build businesses that kind of will make it on social media and be celebrated. But it's like, yeah, but is that a commercially viable business? Are you solving a real problem that if someone was to, was to listen to your sales pitch, they would not only buy, but, you know, tell other people about it. So I think that it was a problem that i faced but it, it wasn't difficult because we'd actually done you know the back end work of doing research um so yeah so that's what i would say and I, and i think again you know being able to use platforms wisely i mean just you know me have i don't even remember that i did this but just having the insight that if you're in a room with people who are key decision makers kdms i call them you need to be able to have a voice and say something meaningful because essentially whoever's in the room might essentially purchase whatever you need to, you're selling. So look, we live in a time where I've seen a lot of young people who say they're starting businesses, but what I've seen is them not being interested in employing people, um, in manufacturing real products and selling these products. What I've seen rather is young people being, um lured by the you know the fame that comes with being an entrepreneur whatever and just kind of going after that and then you see people just wanting to be on the forbes 30 and the 30 or getting awards and it's like that's not what it's about it's about building commercially viable businesses creating jobs solving real problems and then seeing how to scale even though that can happen at a slow pace but that's a real business so even though you're a youth, it doesn't mean you're excused from building, you know, a proper business. It's like youth or not, if you're going to register a business, come with a tangible um, solution. Don't just come with something and then expect everyone to kind of go ooh and ah because you're youth. Like, no. <laughs> wow. Now you can see why I, I love working with the youth. They're just so forceful with their thoughts. Um, so let me share another story. Um, a whole lot of years ago, a young man walked into an incubator and said to me, Miss J, can you please speak to my mom? <laughs> and can you please tell my mom that I want to be an entrepreneur? Because my mom wants me to study, but I want to be an entrepreneur. And the young gentleman was Gift Lubella. I'm, I'm glad that Gift, you have actually done some formal studies now as well. And I'm sure your mom's just as pleased that you have gone down that route. But there's this mindset of being a serial entrepreneur, you know, and you guys spoke about it earlier. You spoke about failings as well. And Gift, you've never let that stop you. So talk to me through the mindset of an entrepreneur and how do you keep going when things seem really, really bleak, especially as a youth entrepreneur, when you're also faced with things like ageism, you know, where you discriminated on because you're a young entrepreneur with these amazing ideas. So talk me through some of that. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Chetri. Um, yeah, my mom actually these days she supports me. She's like my number one fan when it comes to what I do from a from an entrepreneurial point of view. But uh, I think part of how, or how I survived or um, how I managed to go throughout the different many failures that I went through is uh, being an optimist. Um, and I, I'd always believed that you know you need to have positivity. Um, and recently I, I coined the term. Um, it's a, a, a stubborn optimist, and it's a, it's a term uh, by a lady that I really admire. Uh, she's actually the reason, you know, the Paris Agreement um, against climate launch pad is a success today. Uh, Christiana, uh, uh, she, she's an amazing lady, and she says that every single time, no matter, you know, the future or current situation or previously we need to be optimists in every single thing we do. We cannot solve really big problems by being pessimists. So if we are negative towards a solution and we don't want to, sorry, we're negative towards a challenge and we don't want to be having this kind of positive mindset, we would never do anything. And I think that's what kind of kept me going throughout. Um, you know, when I initially started, the obviously idea was to, have a really good, successful uh, company, which didn't happen. Um, and I, I started another one that also, again, didn't, didn't um, you know, go, go forward. And I think it's, it's exactly how the entrepreneurship journey should be. You're not going to start a single idea and then all of a sudden just like sprang to success and do what Tato um, was saying with regards to being on the Forbes list and, you know, being like a rock star and being invited to all these different conferences where you are kind of invited to speak. There's so many other things behind that, that kind of supports um, the success of being an entrepreneur. And I think Jeshri, part of why I became resilient in the journey is a supportive ecosystem and a supportive ecosystem, in my opinion, you know, includes, people who have been in corporate. It includes engaged, uh, um, you know, uh, mentors. It includes uh, active investors. Uh, it also includes founders. And I think I wouldn't probably be where I am today had I not been exposed to these entrepreneurial ecosystems that although I have been failing, I was able to sit down with people who have kind of went through the journey and they've pivoted and it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, a, a failed business. It could be a failed career. It could be, you know, a failed, maybe, I don't know, a business relationship or even a personal relationship. And I think just being in the midst of such people who were able to kind of give you really good insights and the importance of learning what you could get from, from failure kind of helped me persist and, and, and keep on going. I think in, in just a, a quick last, uh, interesting fact that I also uh, learned recently is a good theory by Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio is a really interesting fellow who is, again, one of the best investors I know. And he introduced this really interesting thing in his book called Principle. And it's essentially a formula that would help not only individuals be successful entrepreneurs, but I guess just being a person and a better person. He says they are three kind of words that he used as a formula throughout his journey, which is uh, pain plus reflection equals progress. And so if you, um, you know, feel pain, what you need to do is reflect. And when you, when you reflect upon the pain you felt, something amazing happens, which is progress. And he then says that, you know, we cannot avoid pain. Pain is, it comes in many different forms, right? It can be financial pain, it can be emotional pain, it can be physical pain, but whatever pain it is, that cannot be avoidable. So since we know that pain is there and pain cannot be avoidable, it is almost ridiculous of us to try and prevent pain. So pain will be there. And I guess, you know, in, in, in attempt to answer your question, failure is painful. You know, people speak about failing, but it really hurts and it's not nice. But I think an important next step thereof would be to reflect. And when we reflect and we kind of sit and wonder why is it that we failed? You know, why is it that that happened? If that happened, uh, you know, what did I learn? When we start doing that, we made progress. 
Um, and I think pre pretty much that's how I managed to kind of survive all these different failures. Well, thank you so much, Gift. And you know, um, as I reflect on some of what you're saying, it's the lessons that we see are the hardest to learn by most of the entrepreneurs we engage with is this acceptance that you will fail, but accepting that there's a, a bigger purpose that you're driving towards. So Paseka, you have, um, you and I have known each other now for many years as well. And I'd like to hear from you from a positive perspective. Uh, what do you think have been some of the opportunities that have come your way because you are a youth entrepreneur? and also include opportunities in the form of development as well. Okay, thank you, Jayshree. I must say it has been quite a blissful journey as far as the opportunities are involved. Um, as far as self-development is concerned or personal development, I've received, to, the, to date rather, I haven't paid for my education since metric. That's, that's for one. Uh, because I started my business just off the metric and I've been approached by the Twani Business Club giving me scholarships, the Bertha Center of, of, of Entrepreneurship giving me MBA scholarships. So there has been so much uh, good, good feedback to, to develop me as an individual from an educational perspective. I, I, I got the opportunity to also do an MBA crash course in University of Colorado. I attended an innovation course in Stanford University, a project management course in IE Business School in Spain, Madrid. So it has been very fulfilling as far as uh, personal development is concerned. And then there are the other economic benefits as well. Uh, the nature of the economic benefits is that you also need to remember the vision behind what's driving you. You need to have a strong why. If you just focus on the money coming in and you think it's your money, then you're definitely going astray. Uh, we have made uh, some money and I managed to reinvest most, if not all the money. And that kept on keeping us on. Because if you take care of the business, the business takes care of you. And these other opportunities also align to that extent. And this also falls in line with some of the values that the people who support you resonate with. They too are not about just celebrating an entrepreneur because the, 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 the candidate is youth. They want to see that this youth fellow is going to grow up to be a sustainable somebody someday, not a one hit wonder. So it's, it's very important for you to also resonate with why they're investing in you. As a matter of fact, my investors used to say, we don't invest in the business, we invest in the jockey. We don't settle the horse, we settle the jockey, rather. And they were basically saying that, Pasika, we, we, we like you as a person, and uh, we, we understand that you carry the vision. So it's important for us to ensure that you have what it takes, mentally, spiritually, financially and uh, environmentally so that you can be in a conducive environment to achieve what you want to achieve. So it has been very fulfilling to that extent. I've received support from family, friends, and, uh, and many other individuals that would like to remain anonymous to this day. Uh, these include but not limited to private companies and even some of the public entities of our country. And uh, being in our space, we, we, we also get the opportunity to be among the most reputable of citizens in our country, as far as the highest in cabinet. So you, you get that honor as well, that what you're doing is good. You are contributing not only to the economy, but to society, which is a more fulfilling endeavor than, uh, than what other people perceive as entrepreneurship being the economic benefits to that extent. So to, to me, I feel as if I, I'm also living up to my purpose when I, I am acknowledged for doing the good that I intend to do, the impact that I cause uh, socially, environmentally, and uh, specifically spiritually, because it's, it's something that comes from within. I'm just expressing myself. And uh, I really appreciate it when I am also appreciated with the same uh, 
with the same Kante effect. So it has been a fulfilling, well, you said I should stick to the positive side, Jayshree, obviously. So there's a lot of other things that I'm not saying, but on the positive aspects of what we do, why we do what we do, yes, it is a very fulfilling journey, especially when you get it right, especially when you reach these platforms, these levels, that's when it's all worth it. Well, Paseka, feel free to share some of the other side of it, the challenges. It's okay because we learn the most from understanding what challenges others are facing as well and how we can overcome those challenges. So tell us about some of those not so positive sides of being a youth entrepreneur. Well, Jayshree, I don't think we have enough time for that. <laughs> hey? I must say my colleagues have touched on the, the critical aspects of what we go through as youth entrepreneurs. I'll, I'll touch on the other aspects that uh, are either um, probably personal or more specific to my journey. Uh, in my innovative experience, I've always experienced a catch-22, a chicken and egg situation where I have this concept which I want to manifest. Uh, however, it requires a lot of research and development. And Tato mentioned it well. You need to research. Look, the, the basis of all solutions comes from a background of knowledge of the problem and what you're trying to propose. So research and development has been key to my journey as an innovator. And I, I, I obviously have my limitations. I'm an innovator. I'm not an engineer. So I, I would identify the problem, then, then the solution conceptually. However, I need the expertise to come on board and actually make it a technical uh, solution that's value for money. And uh, that has rather required a lot of money, to say the least. So to get that money from investors is always a challenge because investors are ready to invest in the solution. They don't want to invest in the research and development. So I would find myself either utilizing, back in the day, I would use my grandmother's garage as my office and workshop. So I'd use composite materials to build a, 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 just a demonstrator to get the, the audience to say, ah, now we understand what you're talking about. Just to get to the next phase of, okay, if you were to give me just a little bit to show you what I really want to demonstrate, then you'll see the impact thereof. So then I would move from, from you know, I had, I, I, we, we as entrepreneurs, we have this journey. Uh, we have this vision. It's like, it's like a thousand miles and you, you need X amount of money to get to your destination. However, you only score enough money to get to the next petrol station. And then you need to demonstrate again to get money to the next petrol station. So the journey just became longer and longer over the years because of my chicken and egg situation, which was not the case in other countries like America. You would know the, 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 the dream stories of you just stand in front of a crowd and, hey, there's an investor ready with a checkbook. Uh, that's overrated, by the way. I've been there. But needless to say, it happens more, more, more frequently for one startup to rise to a certain level faster than here in South Africa, depending on your, on your, on your network. And uh, which is another thing. Um, it, 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 along the journey, I got to notice that uh, your network does actually equate to your net worth, depending on how you associate with your network. You can know certain people. However, if you cannot engage at their level in a meaningful value or, or, or in a meaningful way, you cannot derive value from the relationship. And when I mean derive value, I mean two-way. It's not about you. You shouldn't be interesting. You need to be interested, which is another thing that most entrepreneurs miss. They think because they have the solution, then these people need to give them the money or give them whatever they want. No, you first need to meet the criteria of that audience's desire to support. Then only can they attribute with uh, whatever you're asking for. So I've had this chicken and egg situa situation for a long time. Then I've also had a lonely journey, a very lonely journey. This is not for the faint hearted. The amount of time we dedicate into this is 
<laughs> it's ridiculous. We work 16 hours per day, you know, give or take. Uh, then, then, then we, as a matter of fact, I often say, during the day, I attend meetings. During the evenings, I actually get to work. And uh, you, your social life just tends to disappear all of a sudden, you know? I remember in one of my businesses, uh, I had a partner. Things were so hard. Uh, this was, we used to call it attention media. It was an outdoor advertising company. Needless to say, things were so hard. We used to pray so much. My partner decided to be a pastor. Yeah, to leave the entrepreneurship space. That's how hard it gets. So, uh, um, yeah, so that's just one of the challenges. And then another thing is that uh, we also have peer pressure. We are young, you know. We have friends who are progressing in a certain trajectory, which is expected by society, you know. And uh, here we are, we are on a certain trajectory that, no, we have a vision we need to manifest. We have family asking us awkward questions. And uh, besides the awkward questions, some of us still have to take care of the family as well while you're taking care of the business. So you're not only reinvesting in the business, now whatever you have to make for yourself, you also channel in that direction as well. And then your peers also think you're awkward because you no longer hang out the way we used to hang out. You, you now change your dress code as well because you meet a certain audience, right? You're no longer chilling at those ideal spots. And you speak in a certain way as well these days because you need to get the attention. So Jayshree, I've, I've had a, a lot of personal, social, spiritual challenges as well along the way. And uh, I think I should, I should rather stop there for now. I would also like to say, had it not been for my support system, my family has, have always supported me. To be precise, my mother and my grandmother. I was raised by a single parent. It was, I'd be doing an injustice, not to mention the role that my mother has played in this, in this journey. Uh, my mother understood that I need to express myself she would give me the latitude to study part-time if I wanted to, and she would support me in any direction I would take. I obviously went both routes, considering that I'm ADHD, as I mentioned, and she was so vested in my progress that uh, we started a business together as well, uh, where we were, she's a school teacher uh, by passion. Uh, she went into to, 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 she went into entrepreneurship herself to give me the life and my brother's life that, we nev that she never had. We grew up in boarding school because she had to take three jobs at a time uh, when she left teaching. She's back in teaching now. She would, she would sell insurance during the day. She was a tax consultant and she would sell cutlery. You know, uh, There was a company called Butle Butle, one of those multi-level marketing initiatives. But basically, she dedicated so much time to give us the life that we never had. There was a point where I thought she didn't really love us. But when I got into the entrepreneurship space, that's when I acknowledged this thing requires a lot of dedication. And I have so much appreciation for my mother now that uh, she had to sacrifice so much. But because now we are, we are independent, she's back into to teaching because she loves teaching. So had it not been for my support system, I also wouldn't have uh, progressed the way I have. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Paseka. That was just so motivational listening to you. And uh, I can tell we need a lot more time to get through some of these conversations. So Tato, I remember another occasion when um, Bill Gates retweeted one of your tweets while you were in Davos and you were so excited. I remember you sending me a screenshot of this retweet by Bill Gates. And then just a few years later, you had the opportunity to share a stage with this amazing man, as well as some other entrepreneurs. And you've had so many of these wonderful experiences in your entrepreneurship journey. But what's the one that actually stands out for you as the one that you take away the most from or you've learned the most from? Can you please share that with me? Um, I think, look, I didn't get into um, 
you know, being an entrepreneur, pursuing entrepreneurship for the accolades. I think um, one of the things that I, I, I remember being very clear on, um, and I had a, even a conversation with my mother, and, you know, the conversation was around, why am I getting into this? Why do I want to do this business? Why do I want to be an entrepreneur? And um, I think the starting point for me was to learn, uh, learn as much as possible, just kind of invest in, you know, especially in my 20s, learning as much, like more than my peers would. So even though I'm 27, I, I feel like I've lived multiple decades um, in such a short space of time because I was just pushing and challenging myself um, to really know the nuts and bolts of building a real business. And so I think what started gradually happening was the world started paying attention and I was like, <laughs> I didn't get into this for, for, you know, the accolades. And so I think, um, you know, when the Bill Gates thing happened, it, it kind of validated that when you go into something with an earnest heart around really making a difference um, to whoever it is that you're serving through your business, but then also not coming from a place of ego, but rather really investing in just how much can I learn? And I think, um, because of that, it makes it difficult to kind of say there was one accolade that was, you know, better than the other. But I think, um, you know, at, it's one thing to be celebrated um, internationally, but I think it's more important to be celebrated um, locally because, I don't know, there's just something about us believing in ourselves more. Um, we all kind of, like Basika was referring to, um, aspiring to go to um, the US or Europe and then raising however much. And it's like, no, that's not actually what it's about. It's about, you know, building a meaningful business. And so for me to do that, and then I think the moment that was kind of most meaningful was um, receiving the Ubuntu Award um, from President Cyril Ramaphosa in don't remember, I think it was 2018, he'd just come into his presidency. Um, and so for me, that was quite significant. Uh, I think I was 25 at the time, 24, 25. Um, and I just actually, I couldn't believe that, you know, at such a young age, just focusing on getting the nuts and bolts right, learning as much as possible, and just being humble enough to always learn from others, pivot as much as possible, um, and not be stuck on, I want to build this, but rather being willing to evolve and grow. Um, and so, yeah, so when the presidency, you know, paid attention, I was like, well, here's an award. For me, that was like quite meaningful. Um, and I will say this, it wasn't so much about, you know, walking up to the stage and receiving the award and shaking his hand. But for me, what was most important was my journey of being an entrepreneur. I felt as though um, it, was more imp it was less important to be successful and more important to feel fulfilled by my journey and what I was doing. And I think the thing that a lot of people chase is success. And, and it's almost like, you know, to look successful and like I'd rather feel fulfilled than look successful. Um, and i.e. we've got a lot of, you know, people that get into entrepreneurship to have the, you know, materialistic success. But then when you actually engage in, in conversation, I mean, I've, I've had the privilege of meeting various high profile entrepreneurs, business people in corporate. And what became evident is a lot of them were not fulfilled. Um, and you could tell through the conversations in that, you know, there wasn't, I call it, um, one needs to seek having harmony between your being and your doing. So a lot of people have solved for their doing in that, you know, you're doing amazing work, um, your business is profitable, you're employing people, and you pride yourself in employing people, yet your being um, hasn't necessarily developed. And I, and I think, you know, the external validation in, through accolades is great, but what's most important is, you know, your being. And I think 
for me in walking up, you know, onto the stage and, and receiving the award, what was most important is that I felt that I was in a state of alignment um, in, with my being and my doing. And so it, it was almost like the perfect um, way to be recognized. And so even though the Bill Gates thing was like major from an international kind of audience perspective, it didn't mean that much to me because at the time there wasn't any harmony between my being and my doing. I was overworked. I was tired. Um, <laughs> the numbers were not adding up. Um, and so it was like, you know, when, when you think about what people celebrate and, you know, everyone kind of sees the front end of how beautiful um, your trajectory has been, but it's like, you know, are you fulfilled? And, and so, yeah, the Bill Gates thing meant a lot and it was great. Um, I had the opportunity to meet him, um, had, you know, a conversation. He actually knew who I was. Um, but memory, from memory, it's like I felt a lot better two years after that. So it's like, for me, that's what stands out. When I received the award, how did I feel? Not so much what it looked like, the dress I was wearing. Like, that was not important. And so it's like, yeah, I received an award from the President of the Republic of South Africa and I felt like I am fulfilled and yeah, there's no other feeling that's better than that. And there's no amount of money that's going to satisfy um, and, and take that away from you. And so for me, it's like, yeah, if you just kind of focus on finding alignment between your being and your doing, it doesn't actually matter if you're, you know, awarded or not. It's just like you feel amazing every day. You wake up in a state of gratitude, and that's more important than any award you're ever going to receive. Because I've seen people get awards, and you know, you have conversations, and they just, you know, it's it's yeah, it's just not it. And I'm like, that's not life. That's not how you should live. You shouldn't be living because you want to, you know, whatever, get whatever award. It's like it's not worth it. Yeah. So Tato, you know, that's such an important point because it's not about receiving superficial awards, um, you know, but awards that really recognize who you are at a point in time, but you need to feel it. <laughs> so it's not good enough for people to think on the outside, oh, you're successful because you've received an award. It's about you actually being successful at that point in time. And I think that's when it actually means a lot as well. So we're coming towards the end of our session. But Gift, when you think about um, successful entrepreneurs, who do you think about? I mean, who comes to mind um, and why? And with that, I'd also like you to give your closing comments to those that have joined us in terms of whatever you want to share that you think you haven't had the opportunity to share yet. Please close off with those comments. Yeah, thanks, Jeshri. I'm just like, so excited by um by the panelists like every single time so it is i can't stop shaking my head i'm just looking at myself i'm like you need to stop shaking your head um but it's really exciting because for me this is this is what entrepreneurship is right just having the ability to reflect on the importance of your course um and i, I guess going back and sharing that with your peers and uh, Jeshri, you mentioned who do I think of when I think about successful entrepreneurs. And to be quite honest, I actually wrote this in my notes. Um, Tato comes to mind. Um, 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 Paseka comes to mind. Uh, Ludwig Marishan comes to mind. And for me, the reason I put them in the successful entrepreneur criteria is not because like what Tato was saying, because of the accolades and recognition that they have kind of had, I think for me, success is defined by essentially challenging and changing and changing the status quo, right? So creating uh, and changing the narrative, showing others that it's possible, um, showing others that, you know, greatness and, and impactful greatness, that is, is not this elusive thing that is only achieved by the few. In fact, if you even come from like the rural of the rural places, you are able to be uh, uh, impactful in your community, no matter how small it is. And I think it kind of adds to what Tata is saying um, when she's saying that she felt it when she came back home and she was recognized locally. For me, that's what a successful entrepreneur uh, is. And um, 
in, in closing, Joshua, I just want to say, you know, that I, I, I can't stress the positivity kind of mindset enough and being an optimist. It, and I think just with every single person who's speaking now, you could kind of sense that, right? Um, uh, there was no reason for, uh, you know, Pasika to continue and soldier on, even if things were tough. You know, Tato herself had battles that she went through, but she, she kept on going. And, you know, when people are turning you down, particularly corporates, and you have an idea and they're not getting it, and you want to show them that this is good, uh, you need a positive mindset. You know, in South Africa at the moment, there's so many challenges that a lot of entrepreneurs are facing. You know, there's lack of entrepreneurial ecosystems. Um, you know, there's a huge skill gap within the South African uh, uh, economy. A lot of young individuals are going through high school, even college, to kind of learn and, and rather gain some skills to be entrepreneurs. But there's a huge mismatch. Um, and so by the time they either finish high school or, 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 or college, they almost feel like they don't really know how to start, right? There are also policies and regulations in South Africa that unfortunately are still excessive. You know, they, they're very much, uh, there's a lot of excessive red tapes uh, with regards to compliance with labor laws, you know, human and industrial relations, tax and tax related issues, um, uh, legal requirements, municipal regulations that support business or startups. So there's so many obstacles that currently kind of hinder or make it a bit difficult for a South African entrepreneur to make it. But some do make it. And the people I'm speaking with now today have done that. They have managed to go through all of these uh, you know, difficult challenges every single day with this interesting mindset. And I guess in Tato's words, it's the state of being. Um, um, and so for me, I guess in closing, who, uh, with, with, with everyone who's online now, my, I guess, closing remarks is, you know, when you start being an entrepreneur, the idea that you initially start with might not be your last and it might not do well. It might fail, actually. And the second one might, fail or maybe it doesn't fail but you, you might get to a point where you are not feeling the same way with that idea as you initially started and the third one maybe and the fourth one but that's fine right because that's not really what matters what matters is you growing and the lessons that you get from it and i think for you to be able to move from one point to another and another and another without the fire essentially dying is to have a positive mindset a stubborn optimist i guess well, thank you so much for that gift. And very quickly, how can individuals get a hold of your gift? What are your contact details? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I am reachable on social media, uh, Gift Luella. Uh, I also have been trying to write. I haven't written in like months. So I have a little blog, giftluella.com. Um, but uh, yeah, other than that, on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I'm not so much into Twitter, but uh, yeah, Gift Lubele, that's, that's, you're going to find me. Okay. Thank you so much, Gift. Tato, closing comments from you and advice to those that are joined us live, as well as whoever will be watching this on our YouTube channel later on. Closing words of advice. Um, look, I think we, we generally, as, you know, youth entrepreneurs kind of need to also recognize that you don't stay youth for very long. Um, and so with your youth, that is energy that, you know, you need to kind of put towards building something meaningful. Um, I was born in 1992, uh, just before 1994, when we came out of apartheid and I, and, you know, and when I was reflecting around, you know, what type of country did we have, you know, just the economic um, time that everyone was facing in the youth at that time. And I actually want to share, you know, you know, the kind of entrepreneurs that we can take a page out of their books as the youth of today and actually build on what they've done. Um, in 1992, um, Adrian Gore and Barry Swartzberg started Discovery um, and they were 27 years old. I'm currently 27 years old. And so to start an insurance business when you're 27, um, at the height of the apartheid era, a lot of people would have said, you know, what are you doing? Um, and today we've got, you know, discovery being the business that it is and that I think they even, um, 
they've been doing quite a lot of work from a private sector perspective and helping with COVID-19 um, relief. So for me, I, I, I look at, yeah, the likes of Adrian Gold, the likes of Barry Salzberg to say, you can build a multinational business as a young person. Um, and then I also look at, you know what, the, they've been termed the Stellenbosch Mafia and <laughs> we can debate whether, <laughs> we can debate a lot of things around them. But I mean, I, I look at businesses like Richmond, Rainbow, I look at your PSGs, they've built um, meaningful businesses that today, it doesn't matter if it's um, if there's a pandemic or not, but you've got your shop rights um, operating, you've got your PIP um, oper operating. And so for me, I'm like, those are essential businesses. And I don't think a lot of young people are building meaningful businesses that are going to scale to the size of being able to be big enough um, to essentially serve our people. And so for me, I look at those people as being successful and have gone ahead of us. And, 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 you, know, and you know, I think it's, it's, Big shoes to fill. I mean, even Richard Maponya, um, who passed not so long ago, Nelson Mandela was in fact a lawyer um, to Richard Maponya. And I was like, you know, those were people who were during the struggle years banding together and thinking about how it is that they can still bring their vision into manifestation, working together and ensuring that, you know, it doesn't matter the state of the country your your dreams your desires still matter you just need to find um a way of thinking and a perspective that kind of says how can i make space for what i'm trying to do given the current economy because the 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 reality is we do need businesses being started this is in fact the best time and so for me i would just say you know closing quotes we've been here before we've been through a time in history where people were dying you know this is nothing new um it doesn't mean that we should stop being optimistic it doesn't mean that we should stop building in fact this is when we should be building so you know if 1992 27 year olds started discovery and a couple of decades later it's what we know it to be today i'm 27 i just started a business um and so you know give me a couple of decades and i'm I'm going to build something meaningful and so you know it's a challenge to everyone who's watching this to say it is 2020 we do have a pandemic but what are you going to build what are we going to see two decades from now that you would have started during this time so yeah that's how i would close it thank you tasha i mean that's such amazing lessons and for the youth that will be joining us later or you know on our recordings or watching this live do take away some of these lessons because great businesses are born out of the most extreme challenges. And we've seen that happening across the country where individuals have managed to raise millions for startups that are focused on alleviating some of the challenges around COVID-19. So look at every challenge that you face. And in a developing country like South Africa, we have so many challenges that we can solve as youth entrepreneurs or as entrepreneurs and so you guys have all taken a social challenge and you have converted that into a business opportunity and that we have no shortage of in the country in terms of what we need to solve for or even on the continent so tato how can individuals get a hold of you they can't get a hold of me <laughs> <laughs> of course I'm they can them. I'm building a business. <laughs> I'm How can they follow you? <laughs> um, so, and, and it's important actually. I actually, you know, like social media, I think can also be quite a distraction um, to be quite honest. Like people need to be off social media and we need now more than ever people actually just working, put your head down and grind. Um, so yeah, you, you, can't, you can't get a hold of me. Um, but I am currently on LinkedIn. Um, so if there's anyone that wants to kind of, you know, say anything meaningful, that's the platform. Um, all my social media accounts are essentially now used for lifewithtata.com. So I think that's kind of, if you're interested in, in learning about the work that I'm actually doing, that's what you should pay attention to. Not me, the individual. I'm busy. I'm working. <laughs> said beautifully said tato um paseka closing thoughts and please end with how we can get a hold of you 
Okay, I, I actually understand uh, Tato's sentiment there. Hey? This, this, this is not for the faint-hearted. Focus is required. As a matter of fact, uh, there's an acronym for, well, rather, focus is an acronym. Follow one course until success. So understand what uh, Tato is talking about. The, the concentration is vital. Needless to say, I, I would like to, to mention four things. If you're going into this journey, as my mentor once told me, you need to be prepared. This is not for the faint-hearted. You need to prepare yourself mentally, physically, emotionally, socially, economically, spiritually, environmentally, holistically, because you will be tested on all those spheres. So the better prepared you are, the more likely you are to succeed. Then secondly, you need to take care of the business and the business will take care of you. So it's very important to have a delayed gratification attitude. You shouldn't live for the now. You should live for the vision manifested. You should actually live in your vision. Uh, that's another acronym I was told that it's virtually impossible scenario in operation now. So your vision is operating in you and you need to live it. Although people can't see it, most people operate on sight. They might think you're crazy, like some of us have been called quite a few, quite a few times, to say the least. But uh, when you do manifest the vision, then people start to respect you and you actually impact other people's lives because you were, stu you were a stubborn optimist, as Gift would put it. It's very essential. Thirdly, you need to have a why. It's very important to know why you are doing what you're doing. Look, you need to have a level of uh, insanity to actually do this. So you might as well have your own sanity to understand why you're doing this. Take, for instance, people often called me the toilet guy. And I often told them, I'm not in the toilet business. I'm in the water conservation business. I run a water management solutions company. We have a variety of solutions in order to, 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 to combat the water scarcity that the country is about to face. Uh, if you think day zero was scary, look, the worst is yet to come. And this is just South Africa, one of the 30th driest countries in the world. There are many other countries that I'm taking care of. So I have a global picture, yet I'm acting locally, which is another thing you need to understand that whatever value you are providing to South Africa, do by all means to also look where else it can be applicable so that you can have a sustainable growing business. It's a journey and it's not for the faint hearted. Last but not least, you need to take the first step. There is no use talking about one day is one day. Someday I'll start my company. Someday I'll start my own thing. Apparently, the, the, there's approximately 60% of the working force that is over 40 that always thought they will start a business of their own one day. And... Uh, that day has not come as yet. It is a daunting thought considering the situation of the economic status. Starting a business is, is not ideal. I don't want to lie to you. This is not for everybody. I do not recommend everybody to do this. It is not for everybody. I repeat, you need to be prepared. So Jayshree, that's my closing remark. Uh, for those who are not yet in the space and those who are in the space, keep on keeping on. Okay. Uh, where can you find me? Um, if you would like to talk to me personally, I can actually give out my number. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very flexible on WhatsApp. Uh, as for calls, not so appealing. Um, it's 076 772 4596. And uh, as far as Twitter is concerned, you can find me Pasika Lesolang. I'm also on LinkedIn if you want to be more professional, also Pasika Lesolang. The company Instagram page is WHC underscore company. 
And for those who would like to send an email to send uh, some other document you want us to take to the next level, or at least consider, my uh, work email is paseka.lesolang at gwpsaf.org. Uh, my company is part of the Global Water Partnership, and hence I refer to the global aspect of things and uh, it would be good to hear if you would like us to co collaborate or for more impact and for those who are looking for for mentorship um, I do not consider myself a mentor however if you ask a question I'm willing to answer okay that's the best I can do for you thank you very much well, thank you so much for all of those contact details. Everyone, we hear you, Tato, you're in the process of growing your business. So we'll be following your progress. And I'm sure um, individuals that need to reach out to you can contact you via those LinkedIn channels. Thank you for sharing as well. Gift. All of these individuals are Googleable. I promise you, I've Googled them from time to time when I needed information. Um, thank you guys so much. Tato, I appreciate you. I thank you for making time for the session. Paseka, I will continue to follow your progress and we look forward to working with you on our programs that you're currently on. Gift, you've just come off one of our programs, so we will be engaging further. So thank you so much for making time this youth month to join me in this very important conversation. I will be doing a write up of this session and making sure that we publish some of the key lessons that you've shared so that it can reach more individuals that need to hear these very important voices from these amazing youth entrepreneurs. So thank you guys and um, bye everyone. They say people are forced to wave on YouTube. You never do this in classroom, but uh, thank you guys for joining us online. Hey, and have a lovely week and afternoon further. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Jay Shree. You are and, absolutely uh, welcome. All the wonderful things that you do for us to progress as entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, we highly appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Paseka. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.